this uh, testimony reminds me of something I often say, and that's as Christians, we are part of what's called the one another religion. 150 times in the New Testament, we are given the one another commands. We're called to love one another, to care for one another, to encourage one another, to extend hospitality to one another. And I think her testimony spoke just uh, in a profound way of that reality of the churches that we have been a part of. You know, Meredith and I, we have started year seven here, July 1, and y'all are starting to feel like family to us. And for that, I'm, I'm very thankful, very thankful to hear uh, for that. So thank you so much for, for receiving us. Um, did, did you notice in her video the game changer in her life? <laughs> it was that handsome man she met in college. You know, she, she told me, she had the audacity to tell me the other night when she was reflecting on what she, she shared this morning. She goes, you know, Jared, I think the initial p appeal to you was that you were from New York. <laughs> you mean it wasn't my million-dollar smile and my bulging biceps? It was that I was from, from New York. Anyways, uh, men's quartet, thank you so much. Uh, that was a powerful, powerful anthem that you sang for us this morning on, on 4th of July Sunday. So thank you so much for, for doing that. Well, this morning we are continuing on in a series of messages we're calling Unstoppable, God's Church in Action. And what we're doing just for a six-week time period is we are seeing how the power of God's Spirit worked through the early church as witnessed in the book of Acts. Friends, Acts is a powerful portrayal of God's church empowered by God's Spirit doing unstoppable good for the world in which they found themselves in. This spirit-empowered church was a force honestly to be reckoned with as it set out in mission for the sake of and in the name of Jesus. In the face of adversity, in the face of hardship and persecution, nothing would stop these spirit-filled disciples of Jesus Christ from fulfilling their mission. Here's my question for us today, and really the question that encompasses this entire series. Will we at Church of the Lakes, will we at Church of the Lakes stop at nothing to also fulfill our mission of connecting all to Christ to become healthy in God and courageous in love? Well, this morning we are going to look at the life of one of the unsung heroes of the Bible. His name is Barnabas. And what we're going to talk about is how a little encouragement can go a long way. In fact, I think a little encouragement can be life-changing, life-transforming. I think one of the greatest needs in the church today is the need for encouragement. I mean, the Church of America finds itself in the midst of a culture full of people that are tired, weak, critical, and even despairing. And those aren't just people, adjectives for people outside of the church. People in the church, I think, are tired and weak and, and oftentimes critical and even despairing. Uh, this is part, I think, of our cultural negativity towards us as the church. But I also think, in part, it's because we're so biblically illiterate as a church in America. Oh, how we need to be encouraged and also extend encourage to others. So the importance of encouragement is really seen in both the uh, name and the nature of, again, one of the unsung heroes of the early church. His name uh, was Barnabas. real name was Joseph. His nickname, which he went by, was Barnabas. And the lesson we see in Barnabas' life is that if we want to be encouragers, not only do we speak words of encouragement, but we live lives of encouragement. One could argue that when offered in Christ, encouragement is an unstoppable force that can bring unity, unleash, dem, uh, uh, unleash generosity, and also demonstrate God's power. All three of those things, unity, generosity, and a demonstration of God's power is seen in our scripture passage this morning out of Acts chapter 4 that I'm going to invite Barb to read for us. Three in your pew Bibles if you wish to follow along, starting with the 32nd verse. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. 
With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. There was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that belonged to him, then brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. May God richly bless the reading, the hearing, and the understanding of his word. Thank you. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we do thank you so much uh, for the Holy Scriptures, for your life-giving word that does edify and encourage us, God. Lord, I ask now that in the midst of these next few moments, as I offer some reflection on your life-giving word, that you just bless the words of my mouth, the meditation of all our hearts, that they be of profit to us and acceptable to you, for you indeed are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So the pinnacle of my uh, athletic prowess, my athletic stardom, uh, came when I was in fifth grade. Yes, you heard that correctly. 11 years old, Jared Preset was a force to be reckoned with. And I know that to be true because I, at our end of the year uh, award ceremony, I received the most coveted award, the Iron Kid Award. I was the Iron Kid in fifth grade. Uh, this award was given to the biggest and baddest, the strongest and fastest, and dare I say handsomest, <laughs> kid in school. Man, it was a proud moment in my life, do, uh, I, I do say. However, uh, never again would I stand on the top of a podium. Uh, never again would I be bestowed with such an accolade. You see, as I continue to participate in sports all through middle school, high school, and even into college, I was the guy in the team that was just a little better than average. But like my coach, they all knew what they were going to be getting with me. I was steady. I was consistent. I would finish somewhere in the top third or quarter of the, the playing field. I ran a lot, so it was of, the, um, of a race. No longer MVP caliber. Like I said, that was over in fifth grade. However, one award I received countless times throughout my running career was the Sportsmanship Award. To be honest, it kind of felt like an after award, right? An afterthought award. You know, after all the good awards were handed out, the, the coach wanted to come up with something to give the kid who they liked a lot and who was you know, good morale with the team. Sportsmanship award. Again, it didn't really feel like an award. That was until I really started to understand what the sportsmanship award was about. You see, the sportsman on any team is the one who, who kind of is the glue, that holds the team together. It's the one person who is most respected and most liked, not only by coaches, but by, co by teammates. It's that person who really has the ability to set the thermostat at a specific temperature in order to motivate and encourage and also call out the best in other people. You know something? I think every team and every church needs a sportsman, don't they? Every group of people needs that one person who will stop at nothing to not only motivate and encourage, but also to believe the best in other people. In the early church, that sportsman was a guy named Barnabas. You know, we do not have a lot of stories of Barnabas in the Bible. We actually just have four snapshots of, of this son of encouragement in our scriptures. But I think Every one of those snapshots is a remarkable witness of how important the sport, this sportsman was to the early church. You see, Barnabas, uh, Joseph the Levite, had this gift. And, and this gift he had could um, really see the strengths and the usefulness of other people. Again, four stories we have of, of this sportsman in the scriptures. The first, Barb read to us a moment ago about Barnabas selling a, a plot of land. Let me pause for a moment and I digress for just a second. You know, no fault of our own, but I think we tend to look at the work of the early church from this side of history. 
right? But if we can for a moment just kind of try to put ourselves mentally in that space of Jesus' disciples after his ascension into heaven, I think if we can get ourselves there, we might actually admit that we would wonder if the church was even going to make it. You see, we would have been knowing who Jesus was in a personal manner. We would have been with him, ministering alongside of him. We would have seen him crucified. We would have, uh, you know, been part of the resurrection and actually uh, interacted with the resurrected Jesus for 40 days prior to his ascension. But after his ascension, he was gone. Back to heaven. Disciples left with this commandment to fulfill the mission that Jesus had given them to fulfill. Go, Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, Matthew 28. Go, Jesus says, go and bear witness to my love, Acts chapter 1. Now things are getting hard. You see, the joy of having Jesus was beginning to wear off. Persecution from both religious and political entities was beginning to increase at really unbearable rates. Uh, Peter and John, for instance, they had been arrested and beaten. Uh, we looked at part of their story last week in Acts chapter 3. They, they um, did this miraculous uh, feat of helping a crippled man walk again in the name of Jesus. And after uh, they did that, it caused this, this, this lot of commotion in the temple at that time. And the religious leaders didn't like that. So they grabbed the hold of Peter and John. They beat him and they threw him in prison. And the next day, they, they, uh, they have him stand before the, uh, the, the, really the tri- tribunal, a kangaroo court. And uh, they couldn't find any fault with them. So they just sent him away. But they said to them, do not preach in the name of Jesus anymore or something worse is going to happen to you. Maybe even death. So Peter and John go back to the early church and here's Barnabas. Barnabas who just sold a piece of land and gave the money to the apostles in order to underwrite the ministry of the church. Friends, can you imagine the encouragement that must have been to Peter and John? Their broken and bruised bodies still aching, wondering what's going to happen next. And here's this person who believes so much in the work of the church that he gave enough resources to financially fund that church for a given season. That's the first story we have of Barnabas in uh, the early church. The second comes out of Acts chapter 9. And you might actually miss Barnabas in this story because the focus is really on a guy named Saul, a Pharisee named Saul. Um, Saul is a Pharisee who has made it his life's mission to persecute the early church. He wants to wipe the early church off the map. In fact, he is so emboldened with this this desire to, to just kill Christians and destroy the church that he is sent by the high priest, by authority of the high priest, to Damascus to round up the the, the disciples of Jesus there, the Christians there, bring them back to Jerusalem so they could stand before a kangaroo court, get convicted of, I don't know, treason or some other crime, and hopefully put to death. Well, on the road to Damascus, in a supernatural moment in his life, Saul meets Jesus Christ, who calls him to follow him, then changes his name from Saul to Paul. Now, due to Saul's reputation, nobody in the early church actually believed he became a Christian. That is, until Barnabas vouched for him. And because Barnabas stood up in support of Paul, you know what we have? We have countless letters that Paul wrote to the early church in our Bibles that has has served us as spiritual guides over the past 2,000 years. Let me give you one more. Third out of the four I want to give you, just three of them. Another mention of Barnabas comes in Acts chapter 15. And it was a moment when Barnabas stood up in defense of a young pastor named John Mark. So John Mark, in a moment of weakness, uh, deserted uh, the Apostle Paul and Barnabas on a missionary journey. Years later, uh, he wanted to rejoin Paul and Barnabas on another missionary journey. Paul just wanted to wash his hands of John Mark. That wasn't until Barnabas stood up for this man and gave him a second chance. Because Barnabas believed in John Mark, because he extended grace to John Mark, Not only was John Mark restored in ministry, but guess what? He wrote the Gospel of Mark. 
that has been a source of encouragement to Christians, millions and millions of Christians. Uh, Nicky Gumbel, a uh, famous, uh, well-known Anglican priest out of England, says this about encouragement. He says, as oxygen fuels the lungs, so does uh, encouragement fuel the soul. As oxygen is to the lungs, so is encouragement to the soul. Have you found that to be true in your life? I, I mean, I have. In, in moments of, of just disappointment and, and feeling defeated or, or maybe even despairing, when somebody has come alongside and has offered me a word of encouragement, it has made all the difference in the world. It actually had the ability to make me do things or believe things that I maybe wouldn't have otherwise without the encouragement. So there's this wonderful parable of a group of frogs. You heard that right, a group of frogs, parable of frogs, who are hopping through the woods. And they're just kind of in conversation with one another, not really uh, seeing the direction they're moving in or, or what's in front of them. And all of a sudden, as they're hopping, two of these frogs hop into a really deep hole. Uh, when the group of frogs who were, were still um, hopping around notice, they stop, they turn around, they, they're peering into this deep hole, and they, they begin to realize that there is no hope in getting their friends out of the hole. It was just too deep. However, the two frogs in the pit decided they were going to do their best to get out of this hole, to save themselves. So they started jumping as high as they could in this pit, reaching as high as they could to grab the top of the pit and pull themselves out. However, they couldn't do it. The frogs above kept yelling down to them, it's impossible, you're never going to make it. Well, their discouraging and persuasive words finally um, uh, demoralized one of the frogs to the point where he was done trying. He jumped one more time and just fell to his death. However, the other frog would not be dissuaded. He kept jumping and jumping and jumping until finally he jumped one more time and grabbed the top of that pit and pulled himself out. Well, at the top of the pit, the frogs looked at, looked at him perplexed and said, didn't you hear anything we were saying? And the frog responded, no, I'm hard, hard of hearing. I thought all your shouts and animated moves were encouraging me to keep on going the entire time. Friends, one of the unfortunate things about this day and age is I think there are so few kind people around. There are mean-spirited people around, right? There are hate-filled people around. There are people that like to sling mud at one another. We call them politicians, right? But there are very few people who take the time to cultivate kindness as a lifestyle, Yet I believe this is how every Christian, every one of us ought to be. In, in fact, two of our mission measures as a congregation deal with this conversation we're having today. If you remember these little cards we handed out about a week, uh, a week, a year ago, I hope you still have them, you didn't throw them out. But on one side is our mission statement. We're, Church of Lakes is about connecting all to Christ to become healthy in God and courageous in love. And on the other side are nine questions that we call our mission measures. And these questions, we hope you're using as a daily guide to living to help you help us fulfill our mission as a congregation. And they're yes-no questions. And the more all of us as individuals can answer yes to these nine questions each day, the more success we're having in f fulfilling a mission as a congregation. And two of the questions, again, deal with what we're talking about today, and they're as follows. Um... Wow, where's one? <laughs> Did I extend Christ's kindness today? Yes or no? Here's another one. Did I make someone's life better today? Again, we, we can answer yes to these questions. We're fulfilling our mission as a congregation. Barnabas, the son of encouragement. You know, if you were to do a word study out of, in, in that, uh, out of that phrase in Greek, son of encouragement, you could also translate it as son of consolation. Now, the subtlety in my mind adds a lot of depth to the character of this individual. And I say that because the word consolation shares the same root word in Greek as the word comforter. And comforter is a name that we call the Holy Spirit. 
in John chapter 14, verse 26. And by definition, the comforter is one who comes alongside to help another and to offer support. Friends, how are you coming alongside others to provide comfort, encouragement, or support? You know, looking at the uh, name and nature of Barnabas, I want to end this morning by giving you really just, I think, two keys to becoming maybe a greater encourager. Is it that simple? Is it that elementary? This morning it's going to be, okay? Two simple steps to becoming a greater encourager. The first is you got to reach out. The second is you got to reach up. First thing you do, first thing we do is we have to learn to reach out and extend encouragement to those who are desperate, discouraged, and even just other disciples of Jesus. Friends, there is still a need for this kind of ministry today. As followers of Jesus Christ, we need to make every effort to reach out and support and care for people who are in need. So, so I was at the home of a member of our church this past week who, who just passed away, Don Fisk. Uh, he's been on the prayer chain. Some of you uh, may know him personally. And the day that Don passed away, uh, I, I went to his home and I was greeted at the door by one of the Altman uh, chaplains, Pastor Joe. Some of you may have interacted with, with Pastor Joe. Anyways, as soon as Pastor Joe heard that I was from Church of the Lakes, he lit up. And he began to gush for about five minutes over our congregational care ministers who go to hospitals, to homes, to hospice centers to be with people who are in need, to people who are hurting. He said, and I quote, he has never encountered a faith community that is as attentive as Church of the Lakes is in caring for those who are hurting. If you're a congregational care minister, I just want to take a moment right now and say thank you so much for the ministry that you provide to your faith family. Thank you so much for being at the bedsides of people who are hurting, who are sick, who are dying, and for just being an encouraging presence to families and also for, for praying the, the way I know you pray for them in those moments. You know, I, I think I could say our congregational care ministers are modern-day Barnabases, aren't they? But, but here's the thing, and I think here's the challenge to all of us who aren't congregational care ministers. They're not the only ones called to be modern-day Barnabases. We're all called to be modern-day Barnabases in all of our circles of influence, whatever those circles of influence may be. We must reach out and extend encouragement to those in need. The second thing we do is we have to reach up. We reach up so we can grab hold of what God wants for us and how God wants to use us to carry out the mission that God is already doing in our homes, our workplaces, and our communities. You know, we must use really our spiritual gift mixes that God gives every one of us who claims faith in Jesus. We have been given spiritual gifts. That's one of the promises when we get the Holy Spirit, we get gifts with it. And God wants us to use our spiritual gifts to promote and also participate again in the work that God is already doing in our world. He wants us to join him. Now this type of work, however, cannot be accomplished unless we reach up, unless we seek God with all our hearts so we can then recognize and be attentive to the promptings of God's Holy Spirit. And when we're attentive to those promptings, we can find ourselves um, responding with joyful obedience. You know, friends, Barnabas wouldn't have had the generosity to sell that field and give that money. He wouldn't have had the discernment to recognize the calling on Paul's life. He wouldn't even have had the grace to give John Mark in the moment John Mark needed it without being well-connected to God. To be well-connected, to be an encourager, you got to reach out and you got to reach up. Well, these two uh, really steps of being an encourager, to me, are so clearly seen in the persecuted church. You know, it's, it's July 4th, right? I mean, we celebrate, we've been singing about it, we've been talking, we celebrate our freedoms as Americans, don't we? Uh, one of the freedoms we have as American Christians is we can worship in these settings without fear that the government's going to come in and lock us all up. 
Throw us all in prisons or maybe worse. But there's those in the persecuted church don't have that luxury. I mean, claiming Jesus as their Lord and Savior it honestly could be a death sentence in some places around the world. Well, there's this one place I want to talk about in particular. And the place is um, er Eritrea. Eritrea is a country in northern um, Africa. Um, if you've never heard of it, I didn't either until I read this story about the persecuted church there. And in Eritrea, um, there was this woman named Lete. Lete wasn't a Christian, but, but came to faith in Jesus uh, through the witness of another believer. And just as she was kind of entering into God's family uh, with that profession of faith, 70 of her brothers and sisters in Christ just got arrested and sent to prison for their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, this could have quickly demoralized uh, uh, this woman named Lete, but instead, Lete and her friend that brought her to faith started to get the work. Instead of hiding out for fear that they would be captured, they smuggled in food and provisions to their brothers and sisters in Christ who were prisoners. Now, as the saying goes, no good deed goes unpunished, right? Lete was found out, and she got a six-month prison sentence for her um, smuggling the food into to the, to the early church or to the church uh, in, in Eritrea and also for her faith in Jesus. And in an interview about this time in her life, Latte says this, and I quote, it was a good time. She said the days in prison went fast. Why? Because the Christians in prison spent their time worshiping together. And God encouraged and strengthened them each day. You know, I have to admit, church, if I'm in prison for six months, I'm not thinking it's a good time. <laughs> but that's the power of encouragement, isn't it? The Apostle Paul says to the early church in uh, Thessalonica, he says, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. Let me say it again. Encourage one another and build each other up. Whether you're in America whether we're in Eritrea or somewhere in between, friends, we as a church are called to be modern-day Barnabases. We are called who build people up and who demonstrate through us the power of God. By looking for the needs of others and then fulfilling those needs, by looking for the best in other people, and by encouraging those who are discouraged, I think we can breathe oxygen into their souls and help them become everything that God desires them to be. Amen? Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, I thank you so much just for being allowed to have this space at Church of the Lakes to gather for worship with other faithful people and to be encouraged and edified and challenged by you through your life-giving word. God, I pray as we head out into our mission field this week that we, we reach out and we reach up, that we be encouragers to those who are discouraged, to those who may even be finding themselves despairing. But Lord, help us to also extend grace to those who might need grace. And also, Father God, put our spiritual gifts in action so we can make this world look a little bit more like your kingdom in heaven. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.